massive and really, really huge warm welcome to Kath McGaw. Um, Kath is um, with us this evening in person. We're very fortunate to have her, even though she has had 10 hours cumulatively of load shedding over the last 24. So she's feeling a little bit jaded with how much electricity she's not getting. Um, but she's able to be with us here tonight, which is really, really cool. So thank you for joining us, Kath. So um, while I introduce Kath, won't you all just pop into your um, into the poll? Um, you can see the poll that's up. Let us know who you are, where you're from, and a little bit about your little one. Um, and while you do that, because then I'll introduce everybody to you, Kath, I'm going to first take the opportunity to introduce you to everybody. So um, Kath McGaw is a pediatric dietitian. She is the founder of Nutripedes, um, and she really is the source of so much wisdom when it comes to um, early parenting and feeding specifically. Kath holds four medical degrees, um, including one from the John Hopkins University. She's a clinical pediatric dietitian. She is a very well-known speaker. And the reason she's a well-known speaker is that she is an incredible person to listen to. She's, um, she keeps us engaged and she always speaks sense. Um, she's appeared on numerous uh, media platforms, TV, uh, radio, et cetera. She shares her knowledge on infant and child nutrition, breastfeeding, weaning, and instilling healthy eating habits and the developmental and emotional nuances of learning to eat well. And she's also the book, uh, the author of many, many books. So Kath is going to join us a little later, and I'm really, really very excited to have her here on board with us. So Kath, it's time that we actually met who was in the audience. So let's have a look. So about half of the people in the audience are already members of PlaySense. They've got little ones who are in the PlaySense group. So welcome to you. Um, you are very much part of our inner family and we appreciate you. Um, and then we've got about another half of them who are either in another preschool or who are there with the little ones at home with them. So um, welcome to all of you. Um, about 71% of our mums have got little ones who do not have allergies, Kath. So about 30% in the audience do have allergies and intolerances, which is quite high. Um, then we asked the question, is your toddler on dairy milk or a milk substitute formula? 43% on cow's milk, 29% on formula. Um, then we've got 4% on a lactose-free formula. Um, and then 25% other. And then is your toddler allergic to, 71% um, said other, um, which could possibly mean nothing, I think, because there's only a single choice. So other would also mean nothing, but 14% to milk, 7% to nuts, and 7% to eggs. Those are big popular ones, or big common ones, aren't they? Um, and then we asked, what do you find to be the single biggest challenge about snack time? And 39% said picky eating. So um, picky eaters. Um, choosing the nutritional snacks off the shelf. So people who want to know what they want to feed their little one off the shelf, make it easy. 21% um, said knowing what to offer. And 14% said having time to prepare healthy snacks. And we all know about that, of course, for sure. So thank you for filling out the, um, the poll. And then also just before we kick off with Kat's talk, I just want to just introduce for the rest of you who are not part of PlaySense, a little bit about PlaySense schools. Um, Place, I, I represent PlaySense, um, which is um, one of the businesses that I have. Um, PlaySense is a playgroup program where we nurture two to five-year-olds in small groups of six of or less. And that we believe is really important for the emotional development of little ones is a very small group. Um, our groups are home-based. That means sometimes our moms host them with a teacher who we place in the home. And sometimes our teachers host them ourselves. Um, and then, of course, the most important thing is that we have this play-based and play-focused curriculum, which is the way that we believe little ones should learn. Um, and we have a snack time as a very important part of our morning routine. So it has a hero time in that day, in the day. And what happens is that our little ones each bring their own snacks all the parents take turns to provide the snacks for the little ones. And um, that we believe is really important. So the little ones sit and eat together. Um, they eat from each other's plates. We share food. And we also, if one parent is preparing, which is the way we like to do it, everybody gets to have a selection of whatever's going on from that, that home, which is important because it increases our repertoire of feeding. And, you know, moms, what, you, what is quite unbelievable is that the things that your little one will never eat when they're at home, they actually experiment with when they're in a play group setting. So um, that's part and parcel of what we do in the PlaySense program. It's a time for nurturing, um, learning social skills, stimulating the senses and encouraging healthy eating habits. And that's what we're gonna get talking about tonight, Kat. We're going to um, kick off with your talk now. Um, and 
um, for everybody's benefit, um, I asked Kath to record her talk just in the instance that load shedding was an issue. So we have got a recorded talk, but what is fabulous about that is that Kath is going to be here in the background. So if you see down below, there's the chat and there's the Q&A. If you want to just chat about things and communicate between yourselves, just pop something into the chat. If you'd like to ask Kath a question, you can do so at any point during the course of her talk. She's on tap to be able to answer your questions. And then a couple of those questions that look like they're really meaty questions we'll get into a little bit later after her talk is done. So sit back, relax with your glass of wine um, while you listen to Kath giving us all that fabulous information about your little one snack time. Thank you, Kath. Hi, it's really exciting to be back at PlaySense to all you PlaySense mommies and any other moms that have joined us. Um, I'm really excited about this topic. It's quite fun to be speaking about something a little bit different, um, but also something that I absolutely love. So the happy helper toddler, and we're going to be focusing specifically around some lunch boxes and how do we pack those for our toddler. But I, what I've also done is I've included a little bit of information also about the other meals in your toddler's day, because it's always helpful to remember the lunch box in the context of other meals. So firstly, let's just look at who are toddlers. Because if we understand our kind of target market, as any good marketing person would tell you, we know then how to approach them for success. So toddlers, firstly, they're not babies, but they're also not preschoolers. Okay, so they are in between two ages. So they're almost a bit like in no man's land. And um, this can be quite hard for them because they're trying to figure out their identity. One minute they're wanting to cuddle on mommy and, and her to almost feed and give her the bottle. And then on the other hand, they want to be independent and they want to do it themselves. So they kind of vacillate between these two. They are very unique in their own category. They're very explorative. They love to discover and figure out new things. Um, and it's the same when it comes to food. They're very inquisitive and they, they're very interested in new things, very physical and energetic, which makes it very strange when they hardly eat anything and you see all this energy bounding around your living room. Um, they also have very short attention spans and we have to remember this when it comes to feeding the toddler because they've got just this much time to focus on one task before they need to move to another task. And so food can take a long time. It's quite a big task to do. They are often fearless and yet fearful at the same time. So one minute they'll be literally climbing on the couch and be about to jump off it. And the next minute they'll look fearfully when you put something in front of them that they've never seen before and you expect them to eat it. So how does what they eat affect, how does this affect what they eat? So foods need to be easy to eat. That's really important, okay? So something they can just pick up, it doesn't require too much chewing, okay? It's important that toddlers chew, but don't let them labor on the chewing because that makes them very tired. Meal times need to be interesting and not just about the food, you know, it's not just about making pretty faces with the food or fancy stuff with the food, but it's also, it also needs to be interesting around um, just the environment, what's happening, because you've got to keep their attention. And that's why interacting and almost playing with them around meal times is really important. People often um, say we shouldn't do that and almost shouldn't make it fun. But I totally disagree with that. It's really important that we engage and make it extremely fun because then they'll want to come to the next meal. Mustn't feel like a chore. And meals and snacks should be quick and easy. Okay, so it mustn't take an hour to eat. If your toddler is hitting the half an hour mark and going beyond, you're probably not going to have very much success with that meal. So there's been quite a lot of studies to show that what gets eaten in the first 20 minutes is generally 80% of what will be eaten, even if you sit for another 40 minutes of that meal. Every two minutes, your toddler is losing concentration and they need to be refocused or they need something new to to kind of tickle their fancy. Avoid distractions, 
but diverts attention. Okay, what that means is that if someone comes into the house while you are feeding the toddler and it looks way more interesting than what you are doing with them, that's a distraction. They're going to want to rather go there. Um, but diverting their attention is keeping them engaged and keeping them interested and not just focusing on this boring task of chewing and eating food. Just remember that during this phase, there's a lot of taste bud changes. Okay, what tasted neutral yesterday could taste very bitter today. And we know that about the green veggies. So when they were babies, it actually tasted very bland and neutral because the veggies, especially green ones, have a bitter flavor. But the bitter taste buds only really start coming through from about a year, 18 months. So by the time they're a toddler, they've got all these explosive bitter taste buds for the first time, and now they're tasting all these bitter oils. And so suddenly they could actually stick their nose up to this broccoli that they used to have no problem eating. Food boundaries is really important. Okay, toddlers are all about boundaries. They're pushing them all the time, but they, they're trying to figure out how far they can push their boundaries. So what they are looking at is what, where, and when are our boundaries we need to put in place. So what they're going to eat, where they're going to eat it, and when they're going to eat it is what we set up. Consistency is so important, okay? They will they learn through consistency and routine because the more predictable it is, the safer they're going to feel. feel. So remember I said toddlers can be fearless but can also be very fearful and so you need them to feel safe when it comes to the feeding environment so if every time they come to the table hungry you bring out something new and scary they're going to start being a bit less trusting of meal times and not wanting to engage like they used to no short order cooking and what that is is really you saying okay I'm going to give you this now if you don't want that then I go to the kitchen and I make something else for you if you don't want that I go to the kitchen and make something else for you it's a very dangerous game to get into because if you start doing that then they're going to just play you on that and see how many meals you can come out of in one meal time so you don't want to go down that road and then the other thing to just be aware of is milk intake okay milk intake shouldn't be the predominant nutrition at this stage you can definitely include a good milk supplement or nutrition milk drink at the end of the day to fill the gaps for them because they do have these iffy days and on and off days and if they're not feeling great you might want to give them milk at the end of the day but a toddler will very quickly catch on that they can fill up with milk it's much easier it's quicker it meets all the requirements they can do it on the go they can run they don't have to focus on it they don't lose attention it's a nice bit of soothing as well so that is good for what they feel is good for them. So they can very quickly latch onto it and they won't want to get rid of their milk. And especially if it's still in the bottle at this stage. So if you're still on the bottle, if the toddler's still on the bottle, that's that's according to you and your toddler and the journey you're on with your toddler, keep that for the end of the day milk. Do it um, just before bed so that you can brush their teeth and get rid of that milk residue on the teeth. Um, and that is really important, okay? But don't fill them up on milk unnecessarily. So to be or not to be, because sometimes I get questions, what if I do want milk? What if what if my toddler is not eating at all? Um, and some of you who, who might know me will know that I'm not totally against using nutritional supplementation like milkshakes, healthy milkshakes, obviously, supplements. Um, more than once a day, if your child is needing what we call nutritional rehab, where they just really are struggling to get on top of their nutrition, you might have a season of that and then you're going to wean them off. But you want to avoid too much and you only want to do it when it's really needed. So for an average healthy growing um, toddler that is doing fine, I would just recommend one at the end of the day, as I mentioned, but if your toddler is struggling and you, the toddler is sick all the time, and often when they're sick, they don't want to eat, so you actually never get on top of nutrition, it might be important to do a bit of nutritional rehab, boost them for a while, and get them on top of their nutrition. Okay, so let's go to the main focus today. <laughs> Excuse me. Social eating. Okay, so your, your lunch boxes. Um, 
go into school now and it's all exciting and you go off to the shop or you order online these fancy and I've seen the most fancy lunch boxes that you can think of and I want to say to you it's not about how much money you spend on the lunch box or how fancy your lunch box is that's going to get your toddler to eat what's in the lunch box okay so it's more to understand what is actually the purpose of the toddler lunchbox? Now, remember we're talking about toddlers. We're not talking about a school-aged child that is going to need to stay for extra mural and spend 45 minutes on the sports field and then go and do a run, et cetera, et cetera, and then still have to do homework before only getting home at like 6 o'clock in the evening. So the lunchbox for your toddler is really an introduction to eating outside of the home and eating in a social environment and so it's important that um, you see it from that perspective as opposed to how much nutrition you can pack into the lunchbox so what do you pack we're going to go into detail now about what sort of things you can pack but it's more important again that it's about the learning experience of eating outside the home choosing things that they're going to self-feed they're going to gain independence sitting in a little ring or however the, the um, school does it and they're going to now have to learn this process a bit of independent eating so it's quite cute but that's what you want to keep in the back of your mind when packing your toddler's lunchbox the question always should I put treats in or not and I would say yes give a little treat maybe once a week and make it a healthy treat based on your school's policy okay so you might find that your school is a bit more lenient and then you can maybe make your treat choices around that or your school is really strict and you need to then make your treat choices based on that but there are things that you can treat that are healthy and nutritious but you wouldn't necessarily give every day and then drinks I really suggest just sending water to school I think the more water that our kids can drink and the more that they can get used to drinking water at school the better it is and why not start it from the toddler age group I really would discourage sending milk to school um, especially if a toddler's only there for say three to four hours in the morning they definitely don't need milk at school they will be okay if they've had rather if you're struggling with your toddler like if we do nutritional rehab i normally will suggest the the nutritional shake just before school so on the way to school and then when you pick them up they have that in the car going home um, but if they don't need a nutritional rehab then they really just need their milk at the end of the day but definitely not at school so what are some lunchbox do's? Okay, so it's really important to pack bite-sized food. Okay, so that's quick and easy to eat that they can just take with their hands and they're able to eat it. Do limit variety to three, maybe four choices. Okay, because too much um, variety is very overwhelming for your child. You know, they can't, uh, don't, don't translate your short order cooking into a lunch box by trying to put in I'll give them this just in case and give them this just in case and give them this just in case they open it and they go oh my word this is too overwhelming I can't actually manage it do you encourage handheld foods try and avoid sending utensils to school they don't have the coordination to manage a whole lot of um, new utensils and and an environment where their friends are and trying to eat and it's just really really hard it's different if the school is providing a little meal with utensils and everyone's doing it but if you are providing the lunch boxes which are what we're talking about today then I would avoid providing utensils maybe a little yogurt and a spoon if you feel that your toddler can manage that and if the school are okay with that some schools where their toddlers don't actually want any utensils sent with they just want handheld food that the toddler can eat itself so you need to keep it super super simple um, and rather less is more okay and do pack it in 10 minutes what I mean is don't overthink the lunchbox okay keep it simple we have gone lunchbox crazy with parents having so much pressure on them to pack the ultimate lunchbox and again thanks to social media and the 50,000 
different examples that you can give on how to pack lunch boxes. When I was just prepping for this, I was just going through some of the, the social media stuff and just looking for a few pictures. And I was like, I actually got quite scared. I was like, if I was a mom needing to still pack lunch boxes, I would be totally overwhelmed by that because it's it's just doesn't need to be like that it can we need to keep it simple otherwise you just really you're never going to get on top of it you always be trying to better the last lunchbox that you packed and it's going to be exhausting time consuming and very expensive and costly so really really try and keep it simple so so make it a rule pack it in 10 minutes because if you do that it's going to be a simple quick easy lunchbox that's not going to cost you a fortune in both money and time. Lunchbox don'ts. Don't include every conceivable option in the hope that they're going to eat one. And don't send fresh fruit unless you're convinced it will still look good. Okay, so fresh fruits that generally will still look good are more those that haven't needed to be cut up. So little blueberries or strawberries um, or grapes, something like that, or cherries that have been depipped, you can include. But um, if you if you are going to include um, any fruits, make sure that the pips are gone, or don't include that food. Don't spend hours packing a lunchbox, as I mentioned. Keep it short, keep it simple, and avoid foods that use utensils. Okay, so let's do what proteins would go in a lunchbox. Okay, so the size is generally the size of their fist, not your fist, because it's their lunchbox, not yours. So you're going to use biltong or drivors. You could have nut butter balls if the school allows nuts. Um, cold meats, nice, rolled up, which can be quite fun. You can roll it around a bit of cheese. That could be cute. Little meatballs, little cheese bricks. Um, you can do little protein biscuits that you can even make yourself and that can be like a little cheese biscuit or a little peanut butter biscuit and then use a nut butter or cheese spread um, and we'll talk about the starches just now and you can obviously combine it with that. Then starches again the size of a fist so this is all it's a little bit of food not overwhelming amounts of food so it could be crackers it could be a little wrap so it would be one mini wrap wouldn't be like a whole wrap but you would maybe cut it into little wheels it could be a little mini pizza those are really cute and, and the toddlers do seem to enjoy that it could be a low GI bread just literally one slice that you could put some nut butter or cheese spread on close it and cut it up into little bite-sized pieces um, or a little corn or mini rice cake those also work really really well as the starches that you can include then it's nice to include a fat. You can either include a fat on the starch together with the protein um, or you can include it separately like deep pitted olives. Some children absolutely love those. You can make little fat bombs. Fat bombs often will have nut butters in them so you just again check with the school. Avo is not ideal as it will discolor but you can put a bit of lemon and it can work. Um, but it or it can rather be used as a spread on bread if your child really loves avo then it is a nice fat to include but it's not always the easiest to pick up and and so because it can be a bit slimy and it, it doesn't really as you know last very well without getting discolored so then you want to include some colors in the lunch box like piplets, grapes, carrots and cucumber sticks those work quite nicely dried fruit or deep pitted cherries um, any other fruits and veggies tend to discolor. So just be aware of what works and what doesn't when it comes to coloration. If you want to, you can check it out yourself and see how long outside of the fridge a cut up fruit or veggie um, lasts and looks appetizing that you are keen to eat it. Because if you aren't, then they most likely won't. And generally studies have found that kids won't eat large fruits. So if you send like a whole apple um, or a whole banana, they generally feel just too overwhelmed by it and won't eat it. But there are always those exceptions. So if you've got a little one that will munch through an apple happily and you can get those mini little apples, some of those supermarkets sell those as for lunch boxes, and you, your child will, include, will eat that, then that's wonderful and you can include that. But it's not normally the case. 
And then you can have a lunchbox treat day and you can find out in the school it might be a Friday um, and you can just then establish what the school's policy are. So there are a lot of healthy treat options that you can include. I normally suggest treats one day a week. I mean, we don't eat treats every single day of the week and it's quite good and it's also for your budget because as you see these treats, they generally are a bit pricier. And generally what happens then in this case, if there's a treat every single day in the lunchbox, that's what the child goes for and that's all they eat. And they don't actually eat any of the other food that is there. So there's different ideas for treats from the little mini penguins that you can get at some of the supermarkets, mini cheddars, um, little packet of mini, uh, mini packet of raisins, not mini raisins, um, little mini biscuits. Um, dried fruit squares. So dried fruit you can include as the color section because that would be like, for example, a dried peach or a dried pear or a dried apricot, whereas your dried fruit squares tend to be a little bit dusted with a very light bit of sugar. And so include that rather as a treat or like a mini little health bar or one of these healthier chocolate versions like Mr. Oscar there. Those are also quite nice to include as your lunchbox treat. And there are lots of options if you go to Diskem or you go to your, your local, whatever local um, supermarket it is, um, you will be able to find that. So if your child has allergies, um, there, there are certain things that you need to do. So what sort of allergies could children have? Well, the two most severe allergies would be egg and peanut allergy or a nut allergy. And this definitely you have to, um, let the school know. You actually have to take time to meet with the teacher and let them know because these are actually really severe. So in those cases, there's definitely you've got to say please no lunchbox swapping because you do not want your child having something that has been contaminated with their allergens if it's as severe as egg and peanut allergy. Um, and notify party rings because um, when there's a party going on, you go and you want to be notified so that you actually know to pack a substitute for your child and label the lunchbox with the allergy alert stickers. You, moms get their beautiful stickers printed out with their children's names on and if you've got a child with allergy, you can just label it and go like an egg allergy, peanut allergy. Now, you need to explain and understand for yourself the severity. Okay, so for example, if your child's highly allergic to peanuts, even if they get touched by someone who's been eating peanuts, they could have an allergic reaction. So that is obviously something you need to manage with the school and, and they need to know how severe it is. However, you will get some children who have a, a wheat allergy or a dairy allergy, but they can actually tolerate a little bit and maybe the worst that can happen, they might get a little bit of a rash. Then you know that everyone doesn't have to panic if he inadvertently steals something from another child. So you maybe don't even have to be notified versus if a child takes some a bite of someone else's peanut butter bread, then you obviously would need to know. Now, often in cases where school's been alerted of a peanut allergy, that particular class won't be allowed to bring peanuts or nuts to the school, which is actually a good idea, especially the younger age groups. When they're older, I, I believe it's different, but in the younger age groups, I really believe we should be saying to the school to protect the child um, by, by having a nut-free policy for that particular year in that particular group. Okay, well, when you have to go allergen free, it always feels so overwhelming. What do you pack if your child is allergic to wheat or your child is allergic to dairy? There are lots of substitutes these days. It's really not difficult to manage allergies in this day and age. Um, in most countries, it's fairly easy to find substitutes. So keep it simple. So if your child has an allerg allergy to wheat, just replace it with a wheat-free bread. If your child has an allergy to dairy, you can replace it with a wheat-free yogurt. If you want to send yogurt or wheat-free cheese, which you get now, you get sliced cheese, you get feta cheese, you get cottage cheese, you get um, or a variety of shapes and sizes, mozzarella cheese, grated cheese, all as dairy-free options. 
So it's become a lot easier to manage allergies and I'm finding in my practice it's really not difficult for parents to actually manage their child's allergies. So the main thing when it comes to managing the allergies um, during school is for birthday parties and just making sure that you don't swap and share lunch boxes, which is important. So like I said, I want to just speak about lunch boxes now in the context of the rest of the meals because that will also help you take the pressure off lunch boxes for the toddler. Because remember, we're not talking about a child that's going to school now and has got a lot of extra meals. We're just talking about a toddler that's at a little play group or a little school in the morning where you pack in their lunch box and that is just to encourage social eating and develop mental eating independently away from mom. So that's the main focus versus like a lot of nutrition there. So your toddler breakfast tips, you must give enough time for them to wake up. Okay, so if they literally wake up and have to get dressed and get in the car and then you still want them to have quickly down something in five minutes, they're not you, they're not gonna manage that. You need time to wake up their tummies. It could be a small little glass of milk. It could be just a little bit of water. It could be a little bit of tea. It just gets their little digestive juices going. You know, if you wake up in the morning, you don't actually feel starving. That's why many people can easily skip breakfast. But the minute they do eat something, they then start to feel hungry. Um, smoothies rock. They are awesome and they are wonderful for breakfast. They're quick, easy. You can do a smoothie bowl. You can do smoothies that they just drink and it makes it so much easier. It's compact protein and fat packed breakfast is what you want. So nut butters and um, you want your, your protein to be like in the form of um, egg and something that is really easy. So like you doing a little piece of French toast is wonderful. Um, and then you can even put a bit of nut butter on that with some honey and that's just like protein packed. Egg in the morning just lasts your toddler. So it keeps them happy at school and avoids meltdowns. So just keep it simple in the morning. Dairy, protein, a good starch, a healthy fat and a color. And I always like to include a color. Even if your child is striking on colors at the moment, I would still include a color so that they get used to the visual of that is how an actual meal or that is how my lunchbox looks. It's always got a pop of color and that's what you want them to get used to. Then we need to rethink lunch. So you pick up your toddler from school. They've had a busy morning, sociable morning, and now they're really, really tired. Often they'll eat their what's left over of their lunchbox on the way home. And that's quite great and, and healthy. And it's sometimes good to give them something or you bring a little snack and put it in the car on the way home, or you just let them go and have their sleep so that they can just, just have a good sleep. And that's sometimes where it might be helpful to have a little uh, milk bottle that they can just have a, a good little bit of nutrition before they go down to sleep. So that could also be on the way home or a little smoothie on the way home um, out of a sippy cup or something like that. So something that is going to just fill them up with nutrition so they can have their good two hour sleep. And then I love to call um, the, the lunch and the snack, which I'd like to combine, call it lack, like it's a lunch snack, as opposed to having this big lunch meal expectation that they're gonna have. So you kind of break lunch into two, on the way home from school, and then after they sleep, they have a little snack. And it can just really be a color with a protein and a fat. Okay, it's gonna be a little bit of egg, maybe a bit of avo, and it can be a little few bit of berries. And make it fun and playful. It's the afternoon, they're interactive, they're playing. If they've been looked after by a nanny, encourage her to maybe go to the park um, where they all, the nannies meet up with the kids and then they can have their little afternoon lack, their lunch snack. Or it could be something that um, you go and they go and sit under a tree with a little picnic blanket and you go and sit with him and you can play and have their little snack. So that is really a lunch option and a suggestion so that it's simple and easy and you're not fighting over it. And then you want your supper to be stress-free. That is so important. You need to set yourself and your child up to win. 
because you really want to make this an easy transition into the evening routine. So you want calming foods, you want foods for the night that is going to give your child um, just some, some good, feel good serotonin and melatonin. So foods rich in tryptophan is going to really help with this, like your dairy products, your starch products that got high levels of tryptophan, which will help to just allow your child to produce serotonin and produce melatonin, which is the sleepy hormone. And you might find that your toddler eats better if you feed them, if they're willing to be fed at this stage because they're tired and they've spent their whole day trying to process the world and now they just are done. And so now to have to do another activity, which eating is really that for them, it's an activity, is, could just be very exhausting. So if your toddler is willing and you can feed him, then do it. Don't go, oh, but he's so much older, he shouldn't need to be fed. No, then just feed him. Okay, and not too late. So don't be feeding like at seven o'clock at night because then, then you're just setting yourself up for failure because they're exhausted and they need to actually be in bed, especially if they've got play school the next day. So it's really important by six o'clock to have the, the supper done. And then I have a last kitchen call. And this is for that moment where you just kind of didn't quite get it right with the timing of supper and they weren't quite hungry yet. So they've gone to bath now and then you have a last kitchen call. And then you can have a set thing every night, irrespective of whether they ate supper or not. So if they ate supper and they're still happy to, uh, to eat a bit more at their last kitchen call, that just also makes them just feel a bit fuller and keep it simple again. So yogurt, or you can use a dairy substitute, you can use a fat bomb, which is a small little energy dense, protein dense, fat dense little ball, or it can be in any shape or size. There's so many recipes online that you can look at to get hold of fat bomb recipes that are super easy that you can make yourself. Um, a booster milk, so like I said, that would be a time when you could include a milk to fill the gaps for the day. So all the nutrition that didn't kind of come through in the day, you could include there. Um, or a cracker with a nut butter, or cracker with a piece of cheese. Um, you could even do a little smoothie at night. And so plan this ahead of time. It's so important to plan this. Then, then your meal times don't feel so overwhelming. If you kind of have an idea in your head the next few days, What's going to kind of be in lunch boxes? What's kind of going to be in for breakfast? How are you going to end the day? What you're going to do is the afternoon snack. What you're going to do is the last kitchen call. If you have that in the back of your mind, you then are going to be able to just be more relaxed and you're going to enjoy the process of feeding your toddler that much more, knowing that you kind of have thought it through and you know that their nutrition is going to be satisfied. So I really believe that you've got this, okay? So you, you really have this and you know what you need to do. So like I say, plan, 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 plan. Don't fight battles that are not that you're not going to win so when it comes to meal time just to reinforce you are responsible for what they eat where they eat when they eat okay you're responsible to set the scene you're responsible to have the food provided for and you're going to set them up to win so even in their lunchbox lunchbox is not a time to try and um give them all these new flavors and new tastes and that when they're with their friends and their sociable environment rather just give them stuff that they enjoy that you know they're going to like and you know they're going to love and then you've got they've got more of a chance of trust in that lunchbox and wanting to open and eat it with their friends and it's the same at their meal times but make the rule that you always include a color, okay, but colors that they are familiar with. So for example, if they're very familiar and maybe they, and it's always helpful to include things that they used to eat because that means they know it's safe. They just being fussy at the moment and include those things. So if they always loved 
strawberries and then just going through a stage now where they don't want to eat their strawberries, then those are something you can include for color and you could put it in the school lunchbox because you know that they did eat it, they're fine with eating it, they're just being a bit fussy at the moment. So don't then put strawberries and something else and something else and something else because then it's just too overwhelming for them. So it's really important to remember the purpose of the lunchbox and the purpose of feeding the toddler. Okay, so yes, nutrition is important. When it comes to the lunchbox, it's not so much about the nutrition. So you provide nutritious foods, but it's neither here nor there whether they actually eat it or don't eat it in the end. So don't do everything desperate to try and get them to eat it in the hope that they will eat something. So that, that is really important to keep in mind because that takes away the challenge and the difficulty and the battle around eating. Okay, it's a fact. Toddlers, toddlers live on air and this too will pass. So those are two facts that you can absolutely bet your life on, is that they're gonna have days where they look like they're hardly eating anything and they're gonna be super energetic. You're not gonna know how. And you can be rest assured that this season will not last forever. So now we've got time for some questions and I look forward to answering them. I hope you enjoyed that. What an absolutely incredible talk, Kath. Um, as usual, um, absolutely. Hi. It's really exciting oh. to be back. At there we go. Absolutely spot on as usual. Um, you've answered so many questions just in your talk that so many moms have, and then you've gone ahead and answered so many more um, that have come through while you've been chatting. So, moms, this is your opportunity. Kath will be here for probably for the next few minutes just to answer any questions that haven't been answered yet. Kath has answered, asked, answered a lot. Um, so, Kath, um, one of the things, um, while we just wait for a couple of questions to come through because you've answered so many already, um, one of the questions that I just want to think we should go back around, there was quite a few questions around milk and around liquids. And the principle that you said when you were talking was around water being the priority. Can you give your thoughts on things like fruit juice and any other type of liquids that you think little ones would need to be drinking? So maybe fruit juices, tea, um, fizzy drinks, anything like that. So what we call a lot of things like fruit juice and um, sugar teas and things like that are empty calories. And so because toddlers, as we've mentioned throughout the, the presentation, they just, their life is so busy and they've got so much on the go. So the quicker they can get that energy boost, they figure it out very quickly where they can get that from easily and they can run with that. So if they're filling up on the sugars from fruit juices and cool drinks, they're going to think that they don't need anything else and they're not going to actually call for good nutritious food. So I'm very reluctant to fill up toddlers on that. Toddlers are also more prone and at a high risk of surviving on a liquid diet. And um, so we really want to discourage this and just be aware of that. And that's why I said, you know, for a toddler that is developing well, that is age appropriate on all levels, um, maybe be a bit picky or a bit fussy, but generally eat throughout the day. They just need a nice maybe milk at the end of the day before bedtime, and that's actually sufficient. And the rest of the day to have water. I'm not against tea. I think there's some lovely children's teas on the market, um, and especially the ones that don't have added sugars in them and the, the tea bags and those sort of the ones. Um, and I think they can make for a delicious addition to the water that you're going to encourage throughout the day. Lovely, I love it. So we've got one really great question here from Narisa, and this is a question that I actually had, I remember when my kids were little as well, is how many are too many eggs in a day? You know, I mean, because sometimes the only thing you can get in for breakfast and for supper is scrambled egg. Um, is that okay? How, how many eggs can little ones have? Yeah, I'm, I'm so open. I'm so relaxed with that, you know, because I, I know it's stages that they go through. So if they're needing three or four eggs a day or you're doing an egg at every meal time or two eggs, a day, it doesn't matter. It really, if we look what the research we know, even if that continues for a few months, it's not going to harm them in any way at all. And it, it's just going to give them great nutrition. Okay, excellent. Um, and so let's say a little one is stuck on a on a white and beige diet, which actually is quite interesting because this slide that we've got up at the moment actually illustrates that very well, um, the, the beige diet. Um, 
if a little bit stuck on the beige diet, how do we introduce them to more variety? And as Jenna says, um, when is the best time to introduce them to new variety? Yeah, I love that question. And I think, again, it comes back and I briefly answered a question like that earlier on just with, you know, the, the mom who was concerned about her child not wanting fruit. And I think we have this idea that we've got to keep offering it and keep it, uh, like giving it to the child, whereas exposure is very different. Exposure is about non-threatening um, awareness and access to the food. So it's watching mom and dad eat it and it's watching um, siblings or grannies or people like that eat it and having it in the home and accessible and around the child. That is the exposure. And that's why I mentioned at meal times to include color, even if you know your child's not eating it. And you can teach them that if there's something on their plate they don't want, they can put it in the no thank you bowl. And then that's just very respectful, but they're still aware that this makes that food healthy and is nice. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think, again, it's just exposure in a non toddlers when they believe that there's something you really want them to do are more inclined not to do it. So <laughs> it's got you've got to really play the poker face game with them when it, especially when it comes to the fruits and veggies and that color, color range. Absolutely. And then Kath, um, one of the questions here, um, if dinner is generally a tricky meal, which for many of us it is, um, do you end the meal after 20 minutes and then do a snack just before bedtime, which I loved your last minute, your, what, what do you call it, your last call of the kitchen call? <laughs> your, your last, the kitchen, last call. kitchen call, yeah. Call. Excellent. So do you just stop dinner? Like, so, so let's say toddler's just eating just about nothing. Everything's landing on the floor. The, the dog's eating more than the toddler. Do you abandon dinner and do the last kitchen call or what, what do you do at that time of day? Yeah. So, so again, going back to what I mentioned about supper to make it really simple and easy to manage and you know foods that are gentle and easy to digest those are supper is a good time to do a beige diet because it's really low on the sensory level and just quite simple um, but if they even not wanting to do that then I would definitely say after 20 minutes and and also if the fussing like kind of starts escalating rather just call it just say you know what you're probably tired let's go and bath um, and then we can, you know, chat later. So just kind of do that, move them away, calm them down, and then bring them in for last kitchen call. Love it. And an um, opposite question from the one just now about eggs is what if your baby doesn't or your child doesn't like eggs at all? Is that a problem? And can you get it in with things like um, French toast and so on? Yeah, so eggs are obviously just an awesome food because it's just got so many, so much nutrition in it. Um, so if your child is one that doesn't like eggs, often they don't like the texture of eggs. Um, and so then using it in French toast or making it into a quiche or baking it into like an eggy muffin um, is nice. Or you can even, if you're making like a mac and cheese, you can even mix the egg in there as an addition with the white sauce. And that actually can work quite nicely. You can even mix it in a bolognese. So you can just whisk it up and then mix it in there. So there are other ways that you can get it in. Um, so again, coming back, but don't stop exposing them. So if you are hiding the egg to get it in, which is not the end of the world, don't stop exposing them to what an egg actually looks like. So have egg at breakfast, eat around them, um, you know, kind of be, let them be aware of, of eggs in their environment. Absolutely. Excellent. Um, and then a question around um, sleep. Um, so we, this um, attendee's got a 20 month old son who's an amazing eater during the day and does really well with supper. So everything's on target, um, but it's still waking for three formula feeds at night. Um, how do we know if that's hunger or a habit? Sure. So if, if mom feels he is, um, you know, e eating well, like she mentioned, it might be. So sometimes a child can look like they're eating really well but they're missing like one critical nutrient so maybe just check it but if you feel you've ticked all the boxes and they get in enough iron in and they get in enough you know of all the different proteins and general calories and mom is happy with that I would give definitely an end of day possibly I would use then a more stronger nutritional supplement than just a, a follow-on formula so just kind of fill the gaps with a good one and then um, then I would definitely cut back on the night feeds by diluting the bottles because then it sounds like it's probably more a habit. 
Mm, yeah, yeah, I would absolutely agree. And, you know, moms, we, we always say that, you know, taking it, having milk at night as a habit is something that you don't want your little one to have. It's not just associated generally with picky eating, which you know, in this case it wasn't, but it's also associated with things like obesity and tooth cavities and ear infections. You just don't want it. So um, stop, particularly with our toddlers, stop the milk feeds at night. So um, this has been an incredible evening, Kath. I mean, I, I, I think that the, uh, the topic was somewhat misleading. I thought we were just going to talk about uh, lunch boxes, And there you gave us a complete crash course in toddler eating. Moms, if you've got friends who didn't hear this and who didn't attend, this um, is going to be available. Um, we have recorded it. Um, I just think it's just the most incredible nuggets of information for toddler eating. And I'm sure that you'll all agree you can give Kath, Kath a clap um, in the webinar chat or just put a little number one if you found this the most incredible um, talk on toddler eating. So, Kath, as always, thank you very, very much for everything that you do um, and for being with us here tonight. Um, moms, if you haven't signed up to be part of um, Play Sense, do join us. Um, we are we are welcoming um, new new little ones. Most of our groups are actually full. They, they, most of them are about 90% full already um, at the beginning of the year, but we've always got new groups um, joining. Um, so do come and join us. It's absolutely the best, best start in early childhood education for your little one, and we would welcome any of you to, for, um, to sign up with us. So Kath, um, thank you. And just as I mentioned, everybody, Kath has got a, a course inside the app. Um, it's the Weaning Sense course. She's also got a picky eating webinar, which is inside the app, which you can go and have a look at. So do go and have a look inside the Parent Sense app and you'll be able to find that content. And actually this content will be in there as well. Um, so Kath, from us to you, thank you so much. And you can see Kath, the moms have loved it. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good. Number one's all yeah. round. So we really appreciate it. Thank you very much, everyone. Good night. Bye.